So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Lila here as uh, kind of a tantalizer to uh, her remarks. Um, Lila is a first time politician uh, uh, and and is really, uh, there's many, many interesting sides to her life besides politics, I think. She's a singer and has taught music and recorded music. Uh, she plays a couple of instruments, but uh, I think her voice is the, the, the first piece. Um, she's uh, with her husband, operated some small businesses and was recognized in Chestermere as uh, Volunteer of the Year. Um, she and her husband celebrated their 21st anniversary, I think it was yesterday. <laughs> so. Um, and uh, brings a wealth of other things uh, uh, in terms of experience that we'll maybe get a clue to. So uh, energy issues are front and center in Alberta always and uh, will be this fall probably again. And so uh, just in the shadows of the, elect of the uh, legislative uh, calling, we're uh, pleased to have Leela here. And so we welcome uh, uh, critic for energy, Leela Ahir. I'm glad I wore my tall shoes today as <laughs> we up to this podium. Um, thank you so much for having me and for that wonderful introduction. It's a real honour and a pleasure to speak with you. Um, without a question, the Southern Alberta Council of Public Affairs continues to make tremendous contributions to Alberta, um, whether it's in its dialogue that promotes surrounding ideas and policies that will impact the future of our province, or for engaging citizens on all political backgrounds. So we're very grateful for that. Um, with the federal election <laughs> recently wrapped up, I know it feels like you've had your fill of politicians. Nonetheless, um, I hope today that we can have a good conversation about the state of Alberta's energy sector and our economy. Um, it's certainly been a fascinating six months in Alberta. Um, the past provincial election showed us Albertans were clamoring for change. The result has been dramatic and the shift of the political, political landscape has changed immensely. Um, to give some perspective on how drastic a change it's been, um, those Albertans who last voted for change in government are either 62 years or older today. <laughs> that means the vast majority of Albertans, uh, this was their first election ever where those who voted saw actual change in government. Um, as a result, many Albertans are having to adjust with a new government that is bringing a dramatically different approach to implementing policy when it comes to health care, education, the environment, the economy, and the energy industry. And while we certainly believe change in government is good, in fact, we believe it's so good that in just four years, you will make another change again. <laughs> we have genuine concerns about the direction our current government is taking and the impact it's having on Alberta's, lar Alberta's largest sector. So let me be clear. Um, there's no doubt about the low oil price um, leading, is the leading contributor in the recent economic turbulence in Alberta's economy. However, it is the position of the wild rose that the current and possible future pol government policies may be inflaming the current situation. Policies such as a 20% increase to business taxes, higher personal taxes, doubling the carbon tax, regulatory changes, and an ongoing royalty review. As the wild rose shadow energy minister, hardly a day goes by where I don't meet or come into contact with Albertans wanting to talk about exactly what is going on in Edmonton these days for better or for worse. I am here to represent Albertans, so I welcome these opportunities to speak with constituents about their concerns and their ideas. Living in Chestermere, it's just a small city just outside of Calgary's borders, and I've seen firsthand the impact of the recent drop in oil and the new provincial policies and what they've had on our energy sector. Albertans right now are worried about their jobs and the state of the economy, and it doesn't just affect employed or now unemployed in the energy sector. And it affects people from other industries, construction, to retail and to hospitality are all feeling the effects too. It doesn't matter if you're from Lethbridge, Calgary, Grand Prairie or Fort McMurray, the impact of the recent downturn is real and the people want to talk about solutions and ideas to put our province back and right on track. And it was just a few days ago that I picked up the Globe and Mail and saw this headline that immediately grabbed my attention and said, um, 
that uh, job seekers in Alberta consider moves east as opportunities arise in the Maritimes. And then just 10 days earlier, the CBC reported for the first time ever, not a single oil company or a gas company was hiring at the Alberta Employment and Career Fair. And that's the largest such event in the province. It was hard to imagine even a year ago that we would see these headlines and these words reported in the papers and media outlets here in Alberta. And these are challenging times, but it is where we stand today. So not to be all doom and gloom, most people who know me will see me as a, as a huge optimist and a glasses half full kind of person. So to go along with that, the, the, the potential of our, our, of our energy industry, whether it's non-renewables, renewables is truly remarkable. And Alberta's oil sands are home to the third largest oil reserve in the world, after Venezuela and Saudi Arabia. With sensible policies, um, we've attracted investment, um, diversification, and development of the oil sands and has resulted in well over 200 billion in investment in Alberta's economy. In fact, at the end of last year, almost 135,000 people were employed in Alberta's upstream energy sector, which includes oil sands, conventional oil, and mining. And let there be no question about it. The rest of Canada continues to rely on Alberta as well. In 2014, Alberta accounted for a staggering 78% of Canada's oil equivalent production, 78%. On renewables, Alberta already produces more wind power than any other province in the country. And being home to one of the sunniest jurisdictions in the world, we know the potential for solar, for solar power is great. And I personally have 40 solar panels on my own home. So 30 of those are photovoltaic. And um, those actually generate electricity and they go back to the grid in a reverse matter. For those of you who may not know how that works, um, when there's no electricity being generated on a panel like at nighttime, um, it takes from the grid causing the meter to go forward and you're charged accordingly. Um, but then when the panels are generating excess, it, it reverses the meter and goes back to the grid. The other 10 panels on my house are solar thermal panels and they heat the water in our tanks and floors and by heating the glycol, which in turn heats the floors and the water. And what does that mean? It means that my costs for electrical and gas are approximately 80% covered. The panels are a little old by comparison to the new ones, so their efficiency is decreasing a little bit by age and they'll need to be replaced every about 15 or 20 years. Um, but the reality is, is that the demand for energy will not slow down over the next several, ge several generations. And it's clear Alberta can and will have a major role to play in energy production in Canada and across the world for years to come. But let there be no mistake, um, the gains we made in becoming world leaders in energy production can quickly become erased without the right policies and leadership. As many of you know, the challenges facing our energy sector are staggering. They face the need to improve market access to, uh, for Albertans so we can receive our fair share of what we, and fair value actually, on what we produce. Higher costs of operations due to tax increases and royalty review and regulatory hurdles and political opposition to new pipeline projects going forward in every direction. So while the Premier has stated internationally and here at home that Alberta's oil patch remains open for investment, her actions and policies paint a much different picture. So towards market access, it's our view that the Premier has sent out mixed messages on our need to get the product to market. And unfortunately, what happens is with mixed, message, mixed messages, we create uncertainty, and that uncertainty decreases investment. Um, on the Keystone XL Energy Project, this is a pipeline that will result in tens of thousands of new jobs right here in Alberta, along with increased royalty revenues for the province to spend on core frontline services. The Premier has opposed it, arguing in favour for more for refining projects here in Alberta. And I mean, while we agree with the importance of creating more value-added refining jobs, the government has provided zero solutions how to get these refineries built here at home without massive infusions of public money or built with any significant timelines. So when, when the government is telling us it's and its largest trading partner, the United States, that they're no longer increased in promoting critical projects, that will provide tremendous benefit to both jurisdictions, 
It sends a message to the market that Alberta is an unstable place to invest. So the Wild Rose believes that the number one job for the government when it comes to promoting diversification in our energy sector is to promote private sector investment. And um, what that does is that it puts the, puts the taxpayers, it, 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 any role that puts the taxpayers on the hook for billions of dollars in losses when it comes to corporate ventures, uh, it's simply not a responsible way to, um, to use tax dollars. And time and time again, it is shown to be an ineffective way to create economic growth. And while we welcome the government's support of Energy East and the expansion of the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline, we are concerned um, about the recent comments suggesting that Alberta was an embarrassing cousin. When it comes to responsible energy development, that does not help advance our cause, nor does it paint an accurate picture of Alberta's environmental record. Without question, among petroleum producing jurisdictions, Alberta is a global leader in environmental protection in almost every category. Alberta became the first jurisdiction in North America to pass climate change legislation in 2007 and is the only top 10 reserve country, the only major supplier to the United States that has passed legislation of this type. Our energy sector has achieved a remarkable 30% reduction in per barrel emissions since 1990. And according to the Conference Board of Canada, 6.1 billion will be invested in climate friendly technology. In Alberta, that's more than all other Canadian provinces combined. So the fact is, the next time that you hear American politicians try to suggest that Alberta is laggard on the environmental front, they should be looking a little closer to home, in my opinion. California has 13 fields that have higher upstream emissions than the oil sands. Oil from Alaska's North Slope generates more emissions per barrel than Access Western Blend from Canada. And when it comes to overall CO2 emissions, the entire oil sands emits as much carbon dioxide as does electricity generation in Wyoming, which is the least populated state in the entire United States. So Alberta's leadership on the environmental um, on the environment extends to just like beyond just non-renewable resources as well. And I, I know this is no secret uh, for those of you living in southern Alberta, but Alberta, Alberta's current wind production is staggering. So to put it in perspective, um, our current wind capacity um, is enough to be consistent power source for almost 400,000 homes. So we really believe that it's these types of stories that the Premier should be sharing with the rest of Canada and with the world when she travels overseas. Um, but unfortunately, what we've seen is that on recent trips to Montreal, Toronto, and New York, um, that she's suggesting that Alberta's efforts in the environment have been a black eye to this province, and we strongly disagree. Let me, let me be clear here. The Wild Rose knows that there's, there's so much more that can be done. Um, we believe that we should always be striving for the cleanest air, the cleanest water, and the cleanest land in the country. And we believe our provincial neighbors and jurisdictions from outside our borders should look at Alberta and see us as world leaders in this. But these policies, they must be done in moderation without putting the livelihoods of Albertans at unnecessary risk. One example is the latest 20% increase in business taxes and then the doubling of the current carbon tax on heavy emitters. So those both fell within the government's election campaign promises and they are already having a dramatic impact on the viability for many of our energy companies. Um, according to the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, these two changes have meant 800 million in extra costs over the next two years for the industry. That is, 800 million less going into investment and innovation. That means 800 million less that will help companies running razor thin margins stay in the black. And ultimately, 800 million less going to our growing economy. But right now, these costs will not even be the ceiling under this present government. Currently, the government has shown signs and, it's, and is heavily considering floating higher taxes for emitters, a carbon tax that would be paid out of pocket by everyone, and a possible cap and trade scheme with Ontario and with Quebec. Remember, this is at a time when our energy, energy industry has already lost 47 or 40,000 plus jobs at this day, today. And it is our position 
that these extra regulatory burdens will only add additional and unneeded pressure points to the economy. And I mean, many of you might see this um, current as added cost to the energy sector as recoverable. The problem is, is that on top of that, we have an ongoing royalty review in, in place and it's creating uncertainty across Alberta. The current royalty structure established five years ago has helped. It, it attracted investment, created jobs, uh, generated government revenue, and while being responsive to the ups and downs of the industry. Under the current economic conditions, oil and gas capital investments are already down significantly. In fact, Alberta's share of North American capital investment has eroded steadily since 2000, dropping from about 35% to about 15% today. So there's no question that any changes that put our competitiveness at risk will only make these statistics worse. And no one understands this better than the people directly involved in the industry. At a recent community engagement, Open House, hosted by David Mowat, the chair of the royalty panel, many Calgarians expressed um, their own anxieties and um, as they wait for the panel's recommendations and ultimately changes to the current royalty structure. One attendee wrote, why are we doing this now in an economic struggle? We need Albertans back on their feet and a strong economy again. Another one said, don't mess up my job and my livelihood and my major investment. And while I hear these types of comments every day from Albertans whose livelihoods rely on the vibrancy of the energy sector, um, many companies are now being forced to look at their bottom line and make challenging decisions under this difficult investment regime. Wildrose opposed the introduction of a review in the first place for the reasons that I just mentioned. However, we're hoping to keep an open mind and that the review that is now underway will actually lead to more competitive um, rate for investment while guaranteeing Albertans continue to receive good, receive good value for their resources. So, but it would be naive to suggest that the Premier along with several other of the Cabinet colleagues are now looking at raising the current royalty rates. The fact is, is that many have spoken in favour of dramatically increasing the royalty structure in the past. Um, Finance Minister Joe Sisi commented in the media just a few short months ago that the government is expecting a boost of revenues after the review is completed. Now, higher royalties are like higher corporate taxes and they cannot be considered in isolation. With less money available, companies will reduce capital spending, spending on exploration rights, which was lowest 3.7 million last week, and also reduce direct and indirect employment. Employed Albertans are tax-paying Albertans. There's a real risk here that this ill-considered tax and royalty increases will result in less and not more revenue for the government. This means less for health care, education, and all the other services that governments provide. I, along with many Albertans, are hoping they will stay true to their word, keep an open mind, and do what is truly in the best interests of our economy and for the benefit of all Albertans. Altogether, we believe the actions of the government are painting a bleak future for the, our, the economy of our province. So what we're hoping for are, are more signs of moderation that puts ideological and party interests aside for the sake of what's best for the province. Now, I've spent a lot of time walking you through sort of our positions on the current energy policies of the government. So, but it is, after all, the job of the official opposition to both expose and con constructively oppose the government. Um, well, this both broadens public debate and sharpens the government's performance. But we also believe it is our job to propose alternative solutions to Albertans on how to govern the province, uh, protect our industry, and strengthen the economy. Wildrose believes that it is the job of the government to ensure the responsible development of our energy resources. But currently, Alberta has been made the poster child for campaigns targeting the use of fossil fuels and non-renewable resources. We cannot afford to take a lax approach on the environment. Where we differ for, with the government is we don't believe it needs to have come at the cost of economic development or raising the cost of living for Albertans through new tar carbon tax schemes. There's a more moderate and responsible approach for the government of Alberta to take when it comes to improving air quality, water, and land, and lowering greenhouse gas emissions. Unlike the actions of the current government, this begins with a commitment to consulting extensively with the industry and other affected stakeholders, and to ensure that new proposed policies do not harm Alberta's investment climate. We do agree with the sentiment put forward by the government that it is important that our government continues to explore avenues for diversity and our economy. 
Where we disagree is the best, the best method of how to do this. So on creating more value-added jobs, we would want to ensure that we put the, the right policies in place to promote private sector investment and involvement. Um, step one starts by ensuring our value-added industries are not artificially constrained by uncompetitive regulations or tax rates. The government needs to demonstrate to international investors that Alberta is open for business. This means not stunting the growth of our own industries with burdensome tax increases and red tape. Or even opposing critical pipeline projects vital to the province's most important industry. The government needs to create stable economic climate with predictable policies. This is a solution that will attract investment, where we, we, uh, we can preserve jobs, and the government that allows Albertans to give their children the future that they deserve. It also means not criticizing our energy, indust our energy industry with more embarrassing cousin type comments, but instead promoting the steps that have already been taken to reduce emissions and environmental damage. You can also be assured that under a future Wild Rose government, you will see leadership that actively promotes investment and trade opportunities within our international partners and other interested governments. Trips to Washington and Asia and other major trading partners will be a major piece of the Wild Rose government work to promote industry, our, our energy industry and our economy. On the environmental front, we will continue to insist that industry makes progress while clearly communicating with the world that the energy industry in Alberta is the most forward-looking, innovative, transparent, and ethical supplier anyone can choose for their energy needs. Industry must be able to develop technology innovations needed to flourish within, st with, within stable environmental standards. The Wild Rose believes that this has consistently proven to be the most effective approach for taxpayers, the economy, and the environment. To ensure all Albertans have clean air and enjoy, we would tighten and strictly enforce rules and approval mechanisms, regulating their quality in and around heavy industrial zones. To maintain clean water, a Wild Rose government would implement independently conducted water quality testing for all industrial projects to ensure downstream water is unaffected. And we recognize the importance of keeping clean land for municipalities, landowners, and all Albertans to enjoy. Our party stands firmly in support of protecting and strengthening property rights. We want to oversee a system that guarantees that all oil and gas development conducted on privately owned land is done responsibly and that the property is returned to the landowners at the same value and condition previous to its development. To lower Alberta's CO2 emissions, we would look to expand the use of clean burning Alberta natural gas and propane for industrial and residential electricity use as well, as improve the regulatory and business environment for investments into hydroelectric and renewable energy products. Um, I don't want to go over on my time. How are we doing? We're good? OK. So I speak fast, sorry. <laughs> so I'll end with this. Um, Alberta, our Alberta, is an amazing province. We've been blessed with an abundance of resources. These resources literally fuel the people and the communities dedicated to make Alberta one of the best places to live in the world. No one understands the needs of our province better than Albertans themselves. With the new political leadership in Edmonton, it's crucial that during this time in our history that we bring together the right policies and ideas to guarantee our long-term prosperity. We want to help the new government get it right, but we are increasingly concerned. The Alberta needs, Alberta needs leadership that stands up for the interests here at home and abroad, that puts in place the right policies for the environment without handicapping economic growth, and is able to encourage stability and foster investment from across the world. Those are the policies that we will keep talking about. Those are the policies that we will advocate for Thank you so much for your time today, and I look forward to talking with you further. Thank you.